Well, good morning. Good to see you today. If you'll go ahead and take your Bibles at home or here in the room and open them to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, your Bibles or your phones. Thank you, Tommy. And uh, we're just so glad you're here. Those of you that are here in person, those of you that are joining us uh, online. So here's the deal. Uh, We are now in the final two weeks of our fall campaign. Final two weeks. And our campaign has been called More, More. And over the last few weeks, we've been asking this question to everyone. The question has been this. In Sunday mornings, our daily devotionals, in our small groups, the question is, is there more to this life? Is there more to this life? Have you ever thought about that question? I'm sure we all have. And of course, you you know this, right? The answer to that question is yes, yes, yes. There is absolutely more to this life when Jesus is at the center of your life. As you know, in our Sunday morning sermons, we've been talking about the life of Joseph. Joseph in the coat of many colors and his extremely mixed up and dysfunctional family. And so far, we've talked about how life is more than our personal preferences. We've talked about how life is more than just our own little circle of friends. And last week, Tommy reminded us that life is more than just about our career and our jobs or even our retirement. Now today, as we look into Joseph's life, we're going we're gonna to tackle a tough subject. It's the subject where most Bible scholars believe for 12 years or so, Joseph suffered immensely for a crime that he did not commit. Can you imagine being wrongfully imprisoned for 12 years? So today our sermon is called More Than Our Suffering. Is there more to life? than when we suffer. We're, we're going to look at Joseph's time in prison and how he handled it, and most importantly, what we can learn from the moments where we suffer and even how to help other people when we're suffering. Here's what I know. I know that every person in this room and every person at home has been through some type of suffering. You know, the truth is, as I was thinking about this, there are millions of people who have gone through much more difficult times than I have this year. But starting last Thanksgiving, over a seven-month period, Laurie and I lost both of our aging dogs that our children had grown up with. And I got to tell you, it was harder than I saw coming. It it was difficult. We loved our dogs. Sometimes they frustrated us. But when that moment came, for our 15-year-old little mini, it was hard. We wept. And then about three months ago, my walking companion, our 12-year-old Lily, we walked every single day. When she was gone, I I was suffering. And And honestly, probably a little bit of depression. And about a week after that, our kids and their spouses got together and found a very talented person who is an artist and draws, and this person drew a gift for me to comfort some of my suffering. I want to show it to you. It, it's, a, it's a picture of the two of us walking every morning on the trails where we walk. And, and, and when I see this picture every day, it brings me comfort. It does remind me of the suffering, but it brings me comfort as well that God is still Good. Now, let me just say it again. Some of you, even in this room, some of you at home, have been through much more suffering than the loss of pets. As I look around in this room today, I I see people that I know that are in deep suffering right now. I, I know people who are watching right now who have stories where they are in serious pain. But can I remind you what Tommy shared with us last week from the words of Jesus Christ to believers? Jesus said, in this world you will have what? You remember what he said? Trouble. In this world, if you're a Christian, you will have trouble. You will have suffering. You will have pain. It is not you might or maybe someday you will. As we've said many times before, anyone that preaches a gospel and says the Christian life is all about never experiencing difficulty is preaching something false. In this world, 
you will have trouble. I love the end of that verse. But take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And the real truth is that God has a lot to say in his word about suffering and disappointment. And so today, we're going to talk about this issue of suffering. And we're going to learn again from this text about suffering and even how you and I can help others who are in the middle of suffering. So here's our one point today. We're going to drill deep on it. Then we're going to look in the story. Here it is. The point is this. When you are suffering, and you will at some point, when you are suffering, trust in God's sovereignty and trust in God's goodness. When you are suffering, and you will, when you are suffering, trust in God's sovereignty and trust in God's goodness. And we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to walk through two and a half chapters of the Bible by telling the story of Joseph's 12 years in prison. And then we're going to stop along the way, pause in the story and say, now what about us? How can we apply this as we walk along the story? Now last week, Tommy reminded us of the story. Joseph and his coat of many colors. At the age of 17, he's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery by his brothers, and then sold again to Potiphar, who was one of the top officials of the Egyptian pharaoh. In our terms today, Potiphar was kind of like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was a very powerful military person. And God, even though Joseph had become his servant, God chose to rise Joseph in power. But let's look back at verse 6 that Tommy mentioned last week in chapter 39. It's on our screens. It says, So he, meaning Potiphar, left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. And listen to this verse. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And now remember as this story unfolds that Mrs. Potiphar starts lusting over Joseph's handsome form and appearance. And she asks him to come to bed with her. And he refuses. And now I want you to watch what happens right after this moment. Look at verse 11. But one day when he, Joseph, went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment. You see that? She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Don't forget that verse. We're coming back there. He left. He ran. He fled. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. So, pause right there. Mrs. Potiphar seduces him again, and Joseph absolutely does the right thing. Instead of playing with fire, or instead of saying, oh, I, I'm so flattered, but I can't do that, he simply runs. And I want to pause and say, this is so important because the New Testament tells us that we are to flee from sexual immorality, turn the other way, and run. And notice she gathers a crowd around her, and she makes up a story that Joseph had tried to rape her. Now, when Potiphar, her husband, comes home, she repeats this story to him, and he's furious. Look at verse 19 and verse 20. As soon as his master, Potiphar, heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Pause if you haven't heard this story in a while. We see right here a man imprisoned, and it's going to be a 12-year period, for something he did not do. Can you imagine the suffering of being placed in prison for something you didn't do? Here's our first pause and some application for each one of us from this story. Here it is. Here's the first thing. Do the right thing, even if it brings suffering into your life. Do the right thing, even if it brings suffering into your life. I do not say this because it's easy. I do not say this because I get it right every time. I certainly don't. It's just a principle 
that Christian people should be committed to. Do the right thing every time. Not the expedient thing, not the thing that is best for us. Do the right thing. I was talking with Laurie, my wife, about this point and the struggle that I know it is for all of us. And she reminded me of a story of her great-granddad. Her great-granddad was a man named Newton Powell. She never met him, but when he was a young man in his 20s, in the 1920s, he had an oil and water well digging business in Gatesville, Texas. And, And the business was starting to grow, but times were very tough back then. And she told me the story that's been passed down to her family that He made an agreement on a handshake. That was the contract. Anybody remember when your word was your deed, right? He made an agreement on a handshake to dig a well for a man who was looking uh, for water. And so the well was dug. He brought in his team to dig the well. At the end of the process, the man said, I'm not paying you anything. I'm not paying you anything. And so her great-grandfather, Newton Powell, took money out of his own pocket And he paid his workers, but because money was so tight, he went out of business. He had no money left, but he did the right thing to pay his own workers. You say, well, what's the the moral of that? The moral of that is here, 100 years later, that story's been passed down in her family about how Christian people do the right thing, even if it brings suffering. Sadly, Joseph's reward for this is, as I said, 12 years in prison. And even though he's been in prison, you're going to see 12 years, God's sovereign hand, you remember that? God's story about what God wanted to play out in the story of Joseph. God is in charge of this situation. And I want you to notice, God's hand was on Joseph because Joseph continually did the right thing after he was sent to Potiphar. Now, what is really amazing to me at the end of chapter 39 is how God continues to have his hand on Joseph. Verse 21 says, The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, and it says, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And look at verse 23. It says, The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Look at this. Because the Lord was with him. Him And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Do you you see this? Even in prison, he was elevated to a position of authority. Now, I want to move on to a quick summary of chapter 40. In chapter 40, we see that Joseph is still in prison, and he meets two very high-profile prisoners. They are servants from the king of Egypt's house. It's the king's cupbearer and baker, and I always want to say candlestick maker, but it's not in there. It's just, it's not in there. He meets them, and he finds out that they had offended the king some way, and and the prison boss tells Joseph to go look after them. Let's watch what happens. Verse 7 of chapter 40. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, Joseph asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? Now pause and look up here. Can can you see here? Even though Joseph is in prison for something he did not do, he shows empathy and compassion for others. He's sensitive as to why they are downcast. I don't know about you, but if I were in prison for something I did not do, when I met anyone, I would tell them my sob story. When I met anyone, I would say, can you help me right now? But Joseph chooses to care for them. Let's read on, verse 8. They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. Now watch this verse. This is a hinge verse in this story. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Don't miss that. Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. So both the cupbearer and the baker had had some crazy dreams. And do you see what Joseph did? He points to God. He points to God. 
He doesn't spend time telling them his story. He doesn't swap legal notes with them. He just says, hey guys, I'm sorry for what you're going through. God is your answer. God is your hope in this situation. And that leads me to pause. And I want us to go to our second application for you and me in this story. And here it is. Point others who are suffering to God as their only solution. Point other people who are suffering to God as their only solution. Do you know somebody right now who's suffering? I know you do. You do and so do I. Point them to God as their only hope. We must get really good at pointing people in pain to God himself. We must show people that God has the answers to what we're facing. I'll say it again. If I can just confess to you in the room and to you at home, far too often when I suffer, God and his plan is an afterthought. When I am in pain, I I cry out, I want this to end. Why is this happening to me? When is this going to stop? And then I remember at the very end, God, God, God whose son Jesus rose from the grave in resurrection power is the same God who is over this suffering that I am in now. The truth is for all of us when we're suffering or if you know someone is suffering, tell them to pray big prayers. Tell them to physically get on their knees if they are able to do that and cry out and say, God, you are my only hope. God, you are the only solution to what I am facing. We need you, God. See, one of my biggest concerns for all of us as Christians is that I believe that we can unintentionally, this time of year, every four years or so, get obsessed with politics at election time. So much so that it's easy for us to forget that God's on his throne. And don't get me wrong, as Christians and American citizens, we need to be involved in elections in our governmental process. I I agree with that. But hear me. At the end of the day, when this election is over, the most powerful force in the world will still be Jesus Christ on his throne and Christ alone. Amen? Amen? We need to look to him for solutions for our nation. We need to look to him for answers for our home. We need to look to him for the hope eternal. And everything else in life should build on the fact that Jesus is our foundation. Nothing in our lives should be more important to people who are hurting than to point them to Jesus. Christ says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men and women to me. It is time that the people of God lift up Jesus. Now, as you continue to read chapter 40, we see that God, through Joseph, interprets the dreams of the cupbearer. And he's got good news for the cupbearer, not so much for the baker. He had good news, and let me read it to you, verse 13. In three days, he says to the cupbearer, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of his house. Listen to this. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Joseph gives this great news to the cupbearer. He only has one request. He says to the cupbearer, hey, cupbearer, when you get out, please tell Pharaoh that I'm a good guy. Please tell him I've done nothing wrong. I'm suffering in prison, and I've done nothing to deserve this. And can I just go back for just a minute and say something about verse 15, where Joseph says, I've done nothing wrong that they should put me into this pit. Can I just say, this is a reminder for all of us that sometimes we go through suffering in life and it has absolutely nothing to do with any wrong we've done. It just has to do with the fact that we live in a fallen Genesis 3 
world. Yes, it is true that suffering is often brought on by my sin and yours. That is true. Yes, it is true that the enemy, the evil one, Satan, wants to attack families and nations and homes and evil and suffering is brought in. That is true. But believers in Jesus, please hear me. On this side of heaven, Christians need to understand whether we like it or not, sometimes we just go through suffering because for reasons we will never know on this side of heaven and it is part of turning us to Christ himself. Let me ask you a question. If anybody this time of year, last year, right now in 2019, had told you that 2020 would be filled with pain and suffering and loss of life and chaos and hurricanes and storms, would you really have believed it? No. None of us would have believed this year would have come out like it has. It's been filled with suffering. It's been filled with pain. And yet no one in this room is responsible for it. It just happened. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this about you and me. I can tell you that I'll bet you have prayed more this year than you've prayed in a long, long time. Amen? I can bet you this year you have thanked God more this year for your health than you have in a long, long time. I bet that this year you have thanked God for your family and your job and little blessings that you looked over in the past than you have in a long, long time. Amen. Sometimes we suffer. I know it's hard, but may we point to God himself. So it happens. So, of course, you would think, all right, the cupbearer gets released based on God interpreting the dreams through Joseph. He runs immediately and tells about Joseph, but that is not what happened. Look at verse 23. Yet the cupbearer, the chief cupbearer, did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. That's a hard verse. Joseph had been a man of God. He had done exactly what God wanted him to do. He had been faithful to God. He had served others, and yet he was in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Joseph feels forgotten. I'm going to pause for our last application here. It's this. People may forget about your suffering, but God is always aware. People may forget about what you are going through after the moment passes. But God is always aware, believer, of what you are going through. No doubt Joseph felt abandoned and alone. He had one simple request, that somebody in power would see that he was doing God's work and he would be released from prison for something he didn't do. Can I just ask you a question? Have you ever felt forgotten and alone from somebody close to you? Sure you have. You have and so have I. And and again, if, if I'm honest, in my life when that happens, my first response is, why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Why doesn't it happen to her or him? Why me in my flesh? But amazingly, God is sovereign in this story, like I shared with you. And if you read his story going into chapter 41 now, incredibly, Joseph doesn't do that. He simply waits in prison. Chapter 41 tells us two more years have now passed. It's been the full 12 years in prison. Two more years have passed since the cupbearer gets out of prison. And now Pharaoh, the king of the land, has had one of those crazy dreams. And and he doesn't know how to solve it. And out of nowhere, the cupbearer, two years later, has an epiphany. Oh, yeah, there's this guy in prison that interprets dreams. And he tells Pharaoh that he should call on Joseph right away. And Pharaoh does just that, and he tells Joseph, Hey, I've tried everybody, and nobody can give me an answer about my dream. You want a shot at it? And here's what I love about Joseph and his big-time 
faith in God. Look at verse 16. This is the last verse I'm going to read to you. Look at verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh. I love, love, love this scripture. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. It is not in me. God is the one who will do the work here. He turned from himself. I love it. He points to God. He points to God alone. Can I say one final time? If this were me and I were asked and knew that I had the ability to interpret a dream, I'd be looking for a plea deal before I said a word, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, but sign this paper that says I'm getting out right now. But Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph says, it's not me, it's God himself. Well, you know the story, right? He reveals the dream correctly about a famine that's coming to Egypt, and God's sovereignty shows up. And about 12 years after Joseph had been wrongfully imprisoned for rape, in God's timing and in God's purposes, Joseph is finally released, and guess what? He becomes the number two man in Egypt. Sovereignty of God power of God, goodness of God, in a story of suffering, good God shows up. Folks, listen to me. God is always sovereign, even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it. He's always aware of what we're going through, and he doesn't fix things in our timing for our purposes, but he works all things for the good of those who know him and are called according to his purpose, says Romans 8, 38. Trust in God's goodness. Uh, I want to close with this. About two and a half weeks ago, um, I was about to have a couple of surgeries. And uh, as most of you know, or if you don't know, I'm kind of an uptight guy. Uh, I like things just so. I like, you know, high percentage deals. And I was nervous, and I hadn't had any kind of surgery since I was 10 years old. And uh, I was dreading going under anesthesia. I was dreading the recovery. And I was very honest with Laurie, my wife, she knows my nature, and with God that I needed prayer and I needed hope and uh, that I would probably need pain medicine. You know, I was thinking about that. I, I, I just kept saying to God in my prayer, God, I know this is going to be hard. I know, I know I'm going to suffer, but can you, just, can you just please show me that you're with me? I just love those moments where you can see God work. So we checked into the hospital that morning, and I was nervous, and you go through all that, you know, the, the gown and all the stuff that you go through. And I'm worrying and praying and worrying and praying, and the very first person that walked in our room was our nurse for the day. And so she was so kind and talkative, and she told us that she said, I have an unusual name. My name is Charity. My name is Charity. I thought that was interesting, and Laurie says, to her, she says, tell us how you got such a beautiful, unique name, Charity. And immediately she says, oh, I'm a PK. Now, for those of you that may not know what a PK is, that's a preacher's kid. Preacher's kid. And she went on to talk about how her dad, who was a Baptist preacher, gave her the name Charity based on 1 Corinthians 13. So the first person that we interacted with talked to us about the love of God. And she talked about the peace and her job and ministry and how God had worked through the pandemic. And I thought that was really cool. And we talked about how our kids are PKs and all that. And then the very next person who walked into the room where we were was the hospital chaplain who just happened to be a Baptist preacher, who came and talked to us and saw my nervousness and said, hey, brother, God is on his throne today. Hey, brother, I see people in here every single day, and I know you minister to people, but today let me minister to you and to your wife. God is in control. 
And so I went through the surgery and recovery, and here I am today. And I just was reminded in that moment that I, I needed to see God, and I knew pain was coming, that God is sovereign. He knows what you are going through right now or what you will be going through or what you have been going through. He is sovereign and he is good. He is good. You can trust him. Others may forget about your circumstances, but he has not forgotten about you today. That's our God. And that's why we can go through more than our suffering because he's on his throne this very moment. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for reminding us that suffering is real and that in this world we do have troubles. But God, we want to take heart. We know that your son Jesus has overcome the world. God, I pray at this moment for every family, for every home, for every single person who is in the middle of pain right now, that they would sense that you are carrying them. I pray that you would help us to do the right thing, even if it brings on suffering. I pray that you would help us to point people to Jesus when they are in pain. And I pray, God, that you would help us to see you are sovereign. You are good. You can be trusted even when pain seems insurmountable. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection power. May we never forget, God, you are mighty and holy and powerful and in charge of all things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.